Hi, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. This is Dave Burgess. Dave is the author of Teach Like a Pirate and many other publications. Thanks for being here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here and to join you. So tell us a little bit, Dave, about how you've been coping with the pandemic and all of the crazy things going on in education right now. Yeah, so it's been a, a transformation for us as well. My last in-person speaking event was March 13th. And then all of a sudden, of course, uh, the entire calendar got completely wiped clean of all speaking events, all professional development. Just like other people have had to kind of transform what they do, we've had to transform what we do and turn everything into virtual and turn keynotes into virtual keynotes and turn workshops into uh, remote and distant and all that kind of stuff like that. And, you know, it's kind of transformed what books were, you know, we've put out and all that as well. So it's been a transformation for us and it's been a growth opportunity, though. I think that we've learned some uh, great stuff that hopefully is going to help us become even stronger in 2021. I totally agree. I feel the same way. We're learning so much through this that we're going to continue to carry on even when the pandemic is gone. So hopefully it's gone sooner than later, though. (laughs) Hopefully sooner than later. But yeah, I I do think that's one of the cool things about that. Obviously, there's been a lot of tragedy and a lot of bad stuff that's come along with it. But I do think coming going forward, uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, we're going to see some opportunities because now we're going to have a whole set of educators with a whole new skill set. They've embraced you know, some ed technology, maybe to a larger extent, some blended learning models, distant learning, all these kind of things like that. So they're going to be able to take all of what they were doing before, the best of it, the stuff that they do want to keep from that, but then add in this whole new skill set, this whole new perspective on education, and maybe coming forward in 2021, 2022, we'll be able to create something that's even better in the long run. I totally agree. You have the message of helping teachers find their passion and to empower students, and that's just more important now than ever. What have you seen work, or when you talk to other educators, what do you talk about to help inspire that passion? Yeah, so one of the things I always tell teachers is what's unique about you, your particular strengths and talents, your voice that you add to your classroom is what makes you most powerful and effective as an educator. And I think that doesn't change no matter what the circumstances, whether it's whether you're blended, whether you're face to face, whether you are remote, it's still a matter of trying to bring in your passion. And that passion, you know, one of the things I talk about is passion comes in three areas because there's a deep, dark secret in education. Right. And everyone says you have to be passionate. Bring your passion. If you can't find passion for your work, then by God, find new work. You know, they always push this passion thing. But the deep, dark secret is even though we know we're supposed to be passionate about our work, we're not passionate necessarily about everything that we teach. <laughs> and, you know, right. you know, there's those days where you have that content stand, that part of your curriculum. Maybe you're not that passionate about that particular area. So how can you find passion on every day? And so that's why I broke it into three categories. You have your content passion. And then, but then also you have your professional passion. What is it about just being an educator outside of your content and curriculum that you're passionate about? That's a, that's a place that's wonderful to find passion on a daily basis. Embracing that mightier purpose of being an educator and, and embracing your role as a life changer for your students. And so I think that's a, a, that professional passion is a great area to look. And then it's your personal passions too. What outside of education are you passionate about? And are there ways that you can bring some of that into what you do as an educator? No matter the setting, I think those are still areas that we can focus on. That's great. I talk about finding balance in your life, but I like the approach as well to bring in your passions from your personal life into your teaching and really being authentic with your students too. I think it's a fantastic way, not just to be effective, but it's also helps you build rapport and relationships with kids. And they start right. to see you as a human being, you know, as opposed to like a test preparing automaton. And, <laughs> and so, and then also understanding that if that's good for us, that's good for them as well. And finding ways that they can incorporate their passions outside of school. There's like a secret category of hook. So a lot of the hooks that I demonstrate when I'm doing a workshop are what I would term human nature hooks. They're things that just engage humans. You know, hey, this is something I'm hiding from you and I'm building up the fact that you can't see it. And then now all of a sudden I'm gonna make a big reveal of what it is. That's just a human nature thing. We wanna know stuff that's being held from us, right? Or not, that we, we're not supposed to see. We wanna know what that is. And so that's a human nature. But there's another secret category of hook. 
And that is rather than spending so much time trying to get them engaged with our content, we could take more time taking our content and tying it to what they are already engaged in. So students have this wide array of interests that they come to us with. Well, that is all ammunition that we can use to make our content more powerful. So always looking for ways to make that we can make those connections and make it relevant to what they are already interested in. Some of that needs some front loading to be able to know what those interests are for sure. And educators have been doing interest surveys for, for many years, but it goes beyond that in really getting to know your students and their passions. I, I love that connection back to the content. So you talk a lot about, and I just mentioned it, balance and you know finding your passion even during this pandemic. And of course, we all hear there's a ton of pressure on students, families, teachers, everybody during this time. So how do we also bring in this connection to social emotional learning and, and health and well-being for everybody involved, students and teachers? Yes, yeah, so I think that is another one of the benefits moving forward coming out of the pandemic has been an increased focus on SEL, social emotional learning aspects of education. And, you know, so one of the things I say to teachers is, hey, Somewhere probably last March, you were flying in your educational plane. Things were going smoothly. And all of a sudden you were grabbed up, pushed over to the door. They flung the door open, handed you a scrap of nylon and some string, pushed you out and said, build a parachute on the way down, right? And you were forced to transform things right away. And I think that what that did is a couple of things. One is it gave us a lot of empathy for what it's like to be a learner because we're the ones that know stuff. We teach it, the students learn, but all of a sudden everyone was thrown in the position of being a learner at the same time. And so we, we were like, oh, actually it's pretty scary to learn stuff that you don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty scary to do things that you've never done before. And maybe for some teachers it had been a while since they felt that. So everyone was thrown into this position of empathy of how scary it can be to be a learner. And so that was one thing. But then the other thing was that uh, I saw a lot of teachers who were like frustrated and overwhelmed and saying things to me like, I just don't feel like I'm being as, uh, as effective this year as I have been in the past. And my response was always the same. I would say, of course not. It's a global pandemic. Like, you know, this is like, are you kidding me? Right. And so you have to have some grace. You have to have grace not only for yourself, for your colleagues, but also for kids, because kids, just like we are doing something that we've never done before, teaching in a remote distance setting, students haven't learned in that setting before, most of them. And so they're actually doing something new as well. And so we have to have this grace, but then also an understanding that there's always trauma, but now there's a whole layer of trauma on top right. of everything. So in addition to tr previous trauma, now there's a whole layer of trauma on top of everything, understanding that maybe the most important thing is not the next content standard. Maybe the most important thing is not the next chapter in the curriculum. Maybe the most right. important thing is checking in on kids and creating a psychologically safe place for students to learn and a place that they can come and feel safe. And so I think that that focus on SEL is something that's gonna be, again, beneficial moving forward. Some of it's just giving people the, the permission to say, and that's okay, to, to step away from what we've normally been doing. One of my colleagues, and I'll steal this, this line from her, so I hope she's listening, but she said, please forgive me for what I've done right now because this is my very first pandemic. And I think it's a fantastic phrase. It's like, yeah, we, we're all struggling right now and we're all having to be risk takers. So forgive me, it's absolutely. my first pandemic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's not always gonna work out. Things are gonna fall flat. You're gonna slip up and that's okay. Learning is messy. Creativity is messy. All these things are messy. And you know, we talk to students all the time about having a growth mindset. You know, a student comes to us and says, I'm not good at math. And we say, well, well, hold on. You're not good at math yet, right? Or if right. a student were to come to us and say, hey, uh, I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of other people, so I don't wanna do any like, presentations this year. We would never say to that student, oh no, I understand, that's totally a thing. Just go sit quietly in the corner all year. <laughs> you know, we would work with them and develop their skills and, and build their confidence and give them closer and closer approximations to what we ultimately want them to be able to do. With that, that skill development, with that confidence building, eventually we would reach a point where they could be successful. Well, we have to have that same growth mindset ourselves as well. And understanding that all progress is found outside of your comfort zone. And so if you're never uncomfortable, you're probably not learning at the rate that you could. And if, if that's true, that all progress is found outside of your comfort zone, then, well, we're going to see a whole lot of growth development and progress this year because there's a lot of people uncomfortable. 
<laughs> for sure, that is true. You know, you've already talked about this a little bit, but you know, we've been working with some of our teachers around priority standards right now. We have so much flux into we're face to face, no, we're hybrid, now we're back in remote and all of those changes in learning posture. And so that's obviously a disruption to the normal flow of the school year and, and how we're digging into the content. So how do we balance making sure that students are still going to be prepared for the next grade level and yet being very engaging and passionate and, and attending to all of the trauma that might be out there as well? Part of it is understanding that students are resilient and they are going to be able to adjust and adapt to nothing is going to happen this year in your classroom that's going to ruin a student's life. Like if they are not on chapter 14 at the end of the school year, going into next year, it's, it's going to be okay. But if you have not created a psychologically safe space for them to be and reject education and withdraw and feel or have negative emotions and feelings about school because of what happened this year, then I think that's more damaging. And so I would still continue to focus on those, the, those SEL components, those relationship building, those connections. And in fact, to be honest with you, I've seen some teachers tell me that they've built stronger connections with their kids this year than in previous years. You know, we have a lot of students who are maybe introverts, maybe students who have some anxiety with opening up and sharing in class. The ones that raise their hands and blurt out answers are our fast processors, our extroverts. But we have a whole group of students who are introverted maybe you have some anxiety with speaking in class, maybe you're a little slower to process uh, information and don't wanna blurt out the answer right away because they would need some thinking, they need some thinking time. Mm -hmm. And some of them are actually flourishing in this environment. And by providing them opportunities to contribute in ways that don't provoke anxiety and give them that thinking time and allow them kind of an asynchronous style of contribution I'm seeing, and lots of teachers are talking about, they're seeing some students come alive during this time period. Going forward is something that we could look to adapt to what we do. I'm going to change gears a little bit here, Dave. And you mentioned at the beginning, you know, people are going to come into this environment with new skills around ed tech. Talk to me a little bit about what you've seen work or not work as we dig into all of these new things with ed tech. I'm a huge believer in choice. So... The idea that not all assignments have to look the same, yeah. not all forms of assessment have to look the same, right? And so having a more of the mindset of like, this is what I want you to know, but I'm not going to be so prescriptive in how you demonstrate that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So being more concerned with the learning, less concerned with how they show it. And so I think what EdTech offers is uh, opportunities for student creation and for student creativity and saying like, hey, uh, here are a whole bunch of tools. Here's a choice board. Here's, some, here's a whole different a bunch of different ways that you can demonstrate that you're learning this content and you choose something which is going to be effective for you. And so in class, uh, maybe when everyone's together in the same setting, we have this sense that the assessment has to look the same because of just the, uh, the environment. But now with everybody in different places, I think it's opened up this, these opportunities, which hopefully will, again, continue uh, post-pandemic. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing that I would say is that I think that one of the new skill sets of 2020, 2021 is learning how to generate charisma, enthusiasm, and energy through a virtual means, through a screen. Now, this is something that I've worked hard at for years in having to do book study groups and uh, appear at ed camps and different things like that in a virtual setting. And then also now with transforming keynotes and workshops into a virtual space. And so I've seen lots of teachers who are very charismatic, enthusiastic, and passionate face-to-face -face with students. But when they get in front of a screen, it's not just the screen that becomes flat they become flat as well in their affect. After giving a keynote, I'll often talk to the teachers afterwards and say, hey, look at the techniques that I used during that. Like, I want, let's talk about intonation and inflection, speed of delivery, how sometimes I ramped up the speed of what I was saying in order to bring a little energy and enthusiasm to what I was saying. Other times I slowed down, I move in and out of the screen. I use, this, I use a two-dimensional screen in a three-dimensional way to try to almost be like a pop-up book, like coming out of the screen at the audience. 
And so all of these elements I'm trying to add together in order to generate enthusiasm and charisma through a two-dimensional screen. And so I think that's a new skill set of just being an educator in 2021. One thing we've heard from our teachers and leaders, it's challenging right now to be able to have professional discourse and come together around learning and, and just collaborating. Have you seen anything that's working well or advice that you're sharing with teachers? So becoming a connected educator is something that changed my life. It's something that I always try to encourage other teachers to become connected educators. And so there's lots of different spaces to connect. Don't let this be a one-time thing. I would love to connect with your educators. And so like on Twitter, I'm at Burgess Dave. My name just flipped around to Burgess Dave. I'm on Instagram at DBC underscore INC. There you also have to put up with like some sunsets and fitness running posts and things like that too, but also education. I blog at DaveBurgess.com and I wish I could say it's live now, but it's not live everywhere. But I also, I'm starting a podcast myself. And cool. so it's called The Dave Burgess Show. And The Dave Burgess Show will be something they can look for and hopefully tune into. And it should be live with the first episode any day. Oh, that is very cool. And you know what? That's what we're finding. Our teachers are asking for in professional learning is something that's relevant. It's right now. I can tune in for 10, 15, 20 minutes and it makes an immediate impact in my classroom. So I think that's fantastic that you're continuing to share those resources. And some of those are, like you said, through Twitter and Instagram. That's awesome. There's always a space where there are people connecting and collaborating about what you're interested in. And if you can't find that space, um, contact me. I'll, I'll tell you what hashtag they're, they're meeting under or whatever it might be. There's always places where teachers are connecting and collaborating. And it's just a matter of kind of finding your people, finding your crew, finding um, people that are going to uplift, inspire, push you. And you no longer have to be limited by the ideas within your, within your building, within your school system. But you can gather ideas on a global basis, bring them back into your system, and also, also importantly, take what you're doing and share it out, which is another important part. And I was going to say, if you can't find your, your tribe out there, start your own, right? Absolutely. Yep. Just to wrap us up today, again, thank you for being here. Before we leave, is there one thing that you would give as a piece of advice for teacher? If it was the one thing that you could share, what might it be? The word that gets shared with me more often than anything right now is just teachers saying, I'm overwhelmed. I think that a real focus right now on intentional self-care is important and understanding that, see, this is something that's kind of new is that there used to be a geographical separation between work and home. Right. And for a lot of teachers now, that geographical separation has been eliminated. And so what that can sometimes do is allow work to consume everything in your life. And there's no chance that you could possibly feel ready and prepared and done being done right now is just like a, it's a myth, right? You, you cannot possibly be done. You can never be finished right now as an educator because it's just so overwhelming. And so you have to draw that boundary yourself mm -hmm. and know when it's time to step away, to unplug and to make sure that you're taking care of your family, make sure you're taking care of yourself, your fitness, your health, your wellness. And, and so that is not something that is selfish. That is something which in the long run is going to serve your students as well. And so don't ever feel selfish. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care is allowing you to be your best that you could possibly be to serve those that are in your community. So don't feel selfish about self-care. Make sure you make that an intentional part of your life. Thank you for sharing that. Again, I think sometimes we just need the permission and we need somebody to tell us that it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been so exciting to talk to you, Dave. I have so many takeaways from today and I know that our teachers are going to be excited to hear from you and follow you on Instagram and Twitter. So I appreciate that and thank you for being here today. You bet, it was my pleasure to join you.